Uh, good afternoon, I'm Mike Romano, and this is the uh, Committee on the Revision of the Penal Code. I'm gonna wait a few seconds as uh, the public files into our Zoom webinar, and then we'll get started for the second half of our meeting on the death penalty. So we'll wait a few minutes, a few seconds. All right, uh, welcome, welcome everyone. Um, I, I thought today, yesterday's uh, hearing and panelists, I learned a ton and it, I thought it was you know, a really productive conversation. Um, here is um, my suggested uh, game plan for today. And uh, before we get started, I just wanted to make sure that all the members are on board with sort of our agenda for today. Um, first is to make sure that uh, questions that ra were raised yesterday, especially questions where we said um, that we'd like more research from committee staff are addressed to make sure that um, that can be done. And then uh, number two, discuss a framework for making a recommendation because I think this is a little bit different from before. We discussed that this might be a standalone report. I'd like everybody's confirmation that this would be a standalone report as opposed to what we did last year with a single report on lots of different issues. Um, and then uh, tentatively set dates for our uh, next hearing and approve the minutes from February. So that's my rough agenda. Anybody have anything to add? Uh, no. Nope. All right, sound good? All right, so the first was uh, to make sure that um, questions that were raised by members or members of the public or by the panelists that we can set the priority, research priorities for committee staff. I have written down here uh, five or six questions that I think were raised. I wanna make sure that they are all um, out there and we can talk about other things that may have come up. Um, also, obviously, if things come up in the next uh, days or weeks, you should feel free to independently reach out to Rick and Lara um, I don't think that that's any problem. Um, so Senator Skinner, you asked that uh, we track down the number of people sentenced to death by year from 1976 on. That seemed to be a priority and came up repeatedly about the decreasing number of people who've been sentenced to death. And if it's if it's um, too big of a task to do 76 on, we could pick we could go 90 on. No, I, I'm very curious. I think that we can track down that data because like I, as you know, we have this great data sharing agreement with CDCR. So, uh, so we have a lot of data of everybody currently on death row, when they were sentenced, from what county, their race, um, gender, mental health status. We have a lot of demographic information on that. So I think that that would be very interesting okay. to do. Um, I, by year, I'm curious by- By uh, year would be great. And then it would be interesting to see if there was any, um, Demographic change, right? I mean, we knew we know already from what we have is that as, as per capita basis, you're more likely to get death penalty as a black, uh, if you're black or if you're uh, brown. However, did is that different? Was it lesser a factor in the 70s or 80s and become a bigger factor in the 90s? Or has it been a constant? One of the things that I'm very eager to do with our report, as alluded to yesterday, there's been so many reports, so much ink spilled on this issue. I'd really like to try to make as much as possible uh, our report adding, adding something to the conversation rather than just one more uh, you know, brick on the pile. But we do have a bunch of information, I think, uh, and data from CDCR that we'll be able to do some of that demographic information, I think will be at at least a greater detail and more up to date than anything's been published before. But I, but I agree, demographics changing, have district attorneys that have been elected in the various different counties changed? Right. How is it changed by uh, county, by age of the defendant, um, obviously race of the defendant. We'll be able to track, a, track mm -hmm. a lot of that that I think will be hopefully new uh, information. You know, a lot of that is, uh, you know, like Nancy says, is, is like anecdotal right now. 
that prosecutors are, are, are not seeking the death penalty as, as frequently as they did before and juries are not con convicting. Uh, so even if, if we had that kind of data that even where the prosecution elects to, to seek the death penalty, are juries convicting? Um, yeah, I've so never seen anything, down anything, down I think I've never seen anything empirical on that, but it's just anecdotal that, you know, society's norms uh, as reflected in, in jury verdicts are also changing, thus leading to prosecutors not seeking the death penalty. So it kind of just builds on, on that. And I, I don't know, I mean, there must be some kind of empirical data on that. Yeah, I think, I think we can get some of that. I mean, part of the problem is, you know, charging decisions and sometimes charging decisions are made out of public view. But um, I have one of the questions from you, Justice Moreno, to try to discern the percentage of actual death sentences versus death eligible cases over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that what you're getting at? Well, in part, I mean, I just, I just wonder whether they do seek death. Are juries convicting? So, oh, I see, I see. Yeah. I, you agree. The distinction, yes. Yeah, yeah. All th so all three. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, again, I want to be as data forward and focused as possible. So I agree that that would be really uh, interesting. Uh, Senator Skinner, um, I think we, you and I both were really trying to drill down on the geographic disparities as well, and whether or not there have been legal challenges. Um, I think there have been legal challenges, but maybe not legal decisions and try to find out what the law has been on that, um, at least in California, if not elsewhere. That seemed to be an important issue too. Well, anyway, I'm interested in it, but that was something that you raised, Senator Skinner? Yeah, though I think um, I think we got an answer, but it was only in the uh, um, I think Natasha maybe just put it in the chat, but it was uh, that there hasn't been that particular challenge or that particular ruling. So that's, that's what I uh, saw as well. I'd like to see where the litig you know what when it's been raised, has it, has it even been raised? Mm -hmm. I think we could do a little bit of digging in there, but you're right, Natasha did say that the Supreme, the California Supreme Court has, has not addressed that issue specifically, apparently, but we should confirm that. Um, well, and then also, I mean, you know, in terms of our, what we come up with with recommendations, I mean, this, the specter of what we have been talking about or the overriding is how California voters have, um, you know, polls tell us one thing, the voters seemingly, uh, you know, there it's, it's hard to read, really. And um, other than the fact that in the last, the last time it was put before them, they opted not to eliminate the death penalty. So in terms of what, what we may be thinking about recommendations, whether we can um, influence such a um, uh, such a question coming before our Supreme Court, our California Court, in order to to get some interpretation. I I agree, and um, you know I think that's obviously one of the confounding issues about the death penalty in California. The last poll, and this is in our memo that I'm aware of at least, is that a majority of voters support the death penalty moratorium that's been opposed by the governor. Right. And a majority of voters support the death penalty, at least in certain circumstances. Yeah. And of course well, there have been the, the votes on the ballot measures in the past. Right. So we are in this kind of stalemate. I thought it was interesting however, also, I think this like- However, yes? court actions, and thank you judges, can assist in terms of our ability when we have these kind of conflicted to, um, to then enact something statutorily. So while we will, time will tell, but if we take bail, you know, the uh, legislature acted on bail, was then referred, the voters did a different thing. The Humphreys case was just ruled yesterday. Mm -hmm. So 
we will be attempting to put into statute the uh, court's ruling on Humphreys. And, um, and, you know, so that's an example of, so when we sometimes, it is very useful to get some reading or clarity from the court, which then may assist in terms of there being the ability for the legislature to act and to, and to put that ruling statutorily. I agree 100 percent. And of course, the courts are real are, are uh, ruling on legal and constitutional issues that are not, at least in theory, uh, influenced by public opinion. Right. That this is a constitutional issue, whether or not people support it or not. And I think that is particularly if the data and the experts show, which I thought came out yesterday in a way that I was um, not quite expecting is that this geographic disparity is really especially stark in California, um, maybe even more so than the racial disparity, um, that that would be maybe something that the court should look at if it hasn't in the past and to the extent that we think it should be um, addressed either by the court or the attorney general or the legislature. I, 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 it's something that I think that we should drill down on a little bit and collect more data on to make sure that that's actually uh, correct. One of the questions I had, and then I um, did some very basic research last night was, I thought that somebody had said, and this might be a national trend, but not a California trend, that the whiter the county is, the more likely to impose the death penalty. Now, that might be true nationally, but the, the five big counties that are contributing overwhelmingly to the death penalty in California, at least today, and I haven't looked back over time, um, you know, Riverside County, San Bernardino County are, are relatively diverse. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, you know, it's, it's also very difficult to say, you know, do we count Alpine County, which is extraordinarily white, but extraordinarily small in, in, in that kind of analysis? Um, but I would, I would like some further in, and, and, and I guess we sort of talked about this at the top about the demographics, not only of the folks, um, who are sentenced to death or charged with death eligible cases, but also the demographics of those counties, which seek the death penalty more often than those that don't. All right. Um, Justice Moreno, it seems like you also had questions, um, about the stranger versus the, the known victim. And that right. seems to come out of, that seems to be a response in part by people who support the death penalty as an explanation for some of the racial disparities. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we can get some more data on that and information on that, if not in California, but statewide. Right. That seems to be an important question to you. Yeah, and that's dealt with in, in some of the memos that we, that we got, there's just so many factors I think anywhere from five to 200, they, they try to, uh, you know, to incorporate. Um, but I, I, I think that viscerally, uh, you know, a stranger murder is more likely, regardless of race, is more likely to prompt a death verdict. Uh, uh, that's but they, they said they've, they've accounted for all these factors and everything being equal that there's still a race fact, a racial factor in, in the outcome. So that's my intuition as well. I mean, again, let's let's drill down and be more specific about that and see how good the studies are, yeah. uh, you know, on that particular issue. I was also particularly interested in inter interplay between the death penalty and life without parole sentences. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's complicated, honestly. Right. Um, and uh, something that I would like to look at, at least the what has happened in other states that have eliminated the death penalty or states that don't have life without parole. Or mm -hmm. um, I think there's some other information that we can collect from other states. Um, those are the questions that I have written down. Uh, Judge Espinoza, was there anything in particular that you would like staff or others to look into? No, not really. You've hit all the highlights for me. Um, the one thing I was thinking as you were talking about demographics and, and different counties, I wonder if there's a way to drill down on the demographic makeup, not a, the difference between the de demographic makeup 
of the residents of the county and the demographics of the justice actors. Yes. Yeah. What, what does the bench look like? Who, what does the jury which counties look like? have DAs yeah. of color? Yeah. That sort of thing. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, we want to also follow up, uh, Justice Mourinho, on your on the conversation about your opinion about the jury and death qualification and opinions about the death penalty and update that information seemed to, like it needed to be updated. Mm -hmm. but I, I think that that's absolutely right, Judge Espinoza, about demographic. I'm curious about economic uh, conditions in the counties. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm also especially interested in counties that have switched. If there are counties that have switched from being very high death case counties to zero or low and why, I mean, obviously in LA, we've had a very dramatic election, but um, you know, Santa Clara County, Jeff Rosen went from a pretty strong defender of the death penalty to switching his mind. And um, I'm curious about that, or if they're just sort of unseen demographic changes that also are at play. Um, I think that we could collect a lot of that information. And from my understanding that hasn't been quite done or at least is not updated in, in California. And there's been so many developments, honestly, in the past decade that I think are important to count for demographically, but also politically. I, I, I just want to share a thought. And I think Carlos brought this up yesterday that LA County has a unique system of death penalty review where the, there's a committee within the DA's office. I don't know if it was Carlos that brought it up or one of the presenters. Yeah, I, mean, I, but, did. I did, it yeah. came up in the federal context as well. Correct. And I, I remember when I was in 100 and um, a number of death penalty cases were parked in my court awaiting the outcome of that review. I know that um, I was appointing uh, mitigation experts on behalf of the defense and, and the defense was presenting mitigation evidence to that committee. Um, I'm just wondering if there's some way to recommend um, that, that that procedure be become yeah. uh, by statute a, a requirement in, in the other 57 counties. Um, yeah, and, and at very least, I think that we can research I don't know if it's possible to do all 57, but we can certainly go to the big counties to see if they have anything similar. I'd be very surprised if no other county had so. I know that many counties have three strikes panels, for example. Yeah. Um, so I suspect that some of the other counties have some internal, formal or informal process for rather leaving it just to the line homicide uh, district attorney. But I think I mean, that I think would be very interesting to look at too. I think it's worth the effort because it seemed that what we learned yesterday is that process uh, seems to have produced a lower number of death penalty requests from the DA's oh, office in LA County. That, that's interesting. It would be interesting to see when they uh, implemented the processes and if and if that did reflect a change. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. I, I I agree with with all that. Are there other issues? Again, this is. I, I'll give you the sort of our thoughts on timeline and publishing this. Um, we still have a, we have a lot of work ahead. We have an, another hearing on a completely different issue coming up and yeah. risk of overwhelming staff. Um, I do want to encourage you as you reflect and think more about this to reach out to Rick and or Lara if there are specific uh, questions that we don't address here that you'd like to make sure that we see in the report. And obviously we won't publish a report until we all agree um, on it, as we did last time. Um, so unless there are any um, substantive questions about yesterday that you would like uh, committee staff to research, I'd like to switch to a framework of how we'll go forward in terms of making our recommendations around the death penalty, at least my suggestion. Um, Is everybody okay to move on? Yeah. Great. So first of all, uh, I think I've mentioned it a few times as, as an intent, but I don't think that, I'm not sure that we've gotten agreement that, the, that our report and recommendations on the death penalty, it makes sense to be a standalone report rather than with uh, recommendations to other parts of the 
penal code that we may make um, and to publish it probably prior to relatively soon rather than wait till the end of the year. That's my instinct. I don't know if anybody wants to weigh in on that. Yeah, I agree with that because it's, I mean, it's so all encompassing and I think it, it deserves a standalone. Okay, any objection? Okay, as far as timeline, just so you know, with even if we had it all written and perfect today, the publication process of getting it copy edited and designed and do it running all the data is gonna take us at minimum a month. Um, so just so we know, and again, we won't publish anything without uh, an affirmative vote from the committee, but um, I think committee staff will begin to work. And from my uh, perspective, I thought the memo that we received in advance was very good and a very good start towards a report, um, in my opinion. So, um, okay. On how to uh, move forward with recommendations. I see one of two paths and I'm curious about what you think. We could make an up or down vote on whether or not California uh, should abolish the death penalty, period, full stop, and leave it there with the report and data and not, and if we vote to abolish, that's it. If we vote that California should keep it um, to recommendations on how to improve it or make it more uh, effective. That's option, I'm calling that option A. Isn't option is isn't that two options? Well, it's it's an up or down. It's basically it's an up or down vote. Well, it without was it was abolish or which is two options. Yes, that's correct. Uh, it's I'm just organizing. I'm trying to organize my brain according to my notes here. And you are uh, you're, but yes, as long as we understand, yes, just but but that that the really what I'm calling it is just the just a straight up and down vote on abolish or continue to keep the death penalty and keep the other legislative recommendations, ideas kind of out of it. Oh, okay. That would be A. Mm -hmm. B is a vote up and down on whether or not to abolish or keep the death penalty, plus recognizing that the death penalty is very difficult to amend or abolish without a voter initiative. Here are some things that we recommend that we think that we can do short of an initiative that we've discussed. So that's option B. Do people have- B doesn't need the vote of up or down. It just needs the second part you described because the up or down is in A. Sh sure. Well, we could also do C where we don't discuss whether or not we think we should do the, uh, abolish the death penalty at all. I mean, we could just avoid that question also. I mean, you could think of that as a third option mm -hmm. as just making recommendations to, for example, try to eliminate geographic disparities without weighing in one way or another about whether or not the penalty should be abolished. I personally think that we should try to weigh in on that, on the big question, um, but we could avoid it altogether. So the way that I see the three tracks are track one, solely a vote on whether or not to keep the death penalty and a, and a report explaining that vote. Yeah, yeah. Option B, up or down vote on the death penalty plus recommendations to, to improve the system in the interim, recognizing that immediate change is difficult if not impossible. Option three, no vote on the ultimate question about whether or not to keep the death penalty, but only the uh, improvements piece. Do people have thoughts on, is, are those three buckets clear enough? Improvements, no position. Hmm. 
Well, first of all, I think we should wait till we get additional members if, if we are going to have a full complement. Uh, so it might, well, it might be useful to put these three options in writing. Okay. Circulate it so that we understand it. But all of them seem, you know, seem a good way of proceeding. I mean, I just like to think about it some more. That's quite all right. Um, let me take a side track here, a footnote, uh, Justice Moreno, to update you and everybody on, obviously we're short um, two gubernatorial appointees uh, because Song Richardson and John Burton's seats have been vacated. Um, it's my understanding that the governor's office are um, interviewing uh, prospective appointees, but have not come to any final resolution yeah. on that yet. It's impossible, honestly, to know or predict how quickly that will go, or I don't have any inside knowledge on that, um, except to say that I do know that they are interviewing some, um, some people, and they obviously know that there are the vacancies there. No. Okay. Um, I can encourage them as best I can to expedite that decision process. Um, so we may need to make a decision on this without a full complement. It's also going to be tough because obviously whoever they appoint, regardless if it's even if it's tomorrow, they've missed yesterday's meeting. Right. Now they can read all the materials and watch the uh, YouTube video, but they weren't able to participate. Right, okay. So, but that, that shouldn't delay preparation of the report itself without a recommendation that we can discuss some more. Okay. Yeah. Does anybody have any thoughts on that process? Okay, so if I understand correctly, um, Justice Marino's suggestion is that um, we continue to research the questions that we discussed earlier Right. Uh, begin to prepare the report, collect as much data as we can in the interim, and hopefully the governor will uh, fill the two vacancies by at least our next meeting. I don't want to delay this too long because, and then uh, at our next meeting, hopefully take a vote. I will um, distribute a let's call it an agenda for our next meeting that makes clear kind of the three different options that we have, which are up or down vote on the death penalty without further explanation, full stop period, up or down vote on the death penalty plus recommendations, that's option B, mm -hmm. and option C being agnostic on whether or not the death penalty should be, or silent, let's say, on whether or not the death penalty should be abolished, but here are some recommendations to improve right. some of the problems that we have. We've yeah. Judge Espinosa, does that seem right to you? Senator Skinner? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just so you know, some of the um, improvements or alternative suggestions that I think were actually quite novel that I was interested in, and this will, I guess, be our last. Uh, topic, at least on the death penalty, then we have some business to take care of, um, that I would like to think about and explore some more and I encourage you all to do in advance of our next conversation about this, um, that I actually haven't heard. Um, again, I'm not an expert in this, but um, do we want to encourage um, attorney general oversight here, especially if there's geographic disparities according to California Constitution may even require it, but at least allows the district, the Attorney General, to exercise authority to make ensure consistencies of statutes. That seemed it was brought up by the Stikers, who were talking about the federal system. Right. Where if you're a, a U.S. Attorney in um, Kentucky, you still need to go to Washington to get a right. That's that's true in the federal system. I mean. We could explore different options. Is it just oversight? Is it just data collection? Uh, is it ultimate authority? Uh, 
I mean, I, I, you know, without studying it, I mean, I see some real issues with respect to the AG, even though they are the chief law enforcement officer, you know, countermanding a D, local DA's decision to seek the death penalty. The DA is a, is a local elected official uh, responsive to, you know, to his jurisdiction. The attorney general is also an elected official. So that delegation of powers, I think, is, is, is quite complicated. I mean, uh, I think Peter and I both work. Peter, did you work at the city attorney's office in LA? No, I was a deputy public defender. Yeah, okay, you're on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, the city attorney was delegated the responsibility of handling misdemeanors by the DA. Uh, right. And that raises cer certain issues. So that delegation issue, I think is, is one that has to be looked at. You know, second, you know, when you, whenever you're dealing with an elected official, like we are in Los Angeles, you know, with the Board of Supervisors having some control over the sheriff uh, and his activities, it, it raises, you know, to what extent is an independently elected official sort of immune from either at a minimum oversight or subpoena power, you know, budget and a lot of other things. And so I think the relationship between an AG and the district attorney historically has to be looked at. But when you're talking about, you know, this kind of centralized uh, oversight or control like we have in the federal system, you know, it's, it's actually a different department, whereas the AG of the United States is the, in the direct line of supervision from the local US attorneys. They basically work for him. And I don't think the same can be said about DAs and AGs. I don't have a closed mind on it, but I think it merits, you know, examination. It's gonna be challenging. Um, yeah. And I think depending on how you define oversight, um, will define the, the response that you get from 58, you know, elected officials. Listen, I, I am certain that, you know, nobody likes to be, have oversight over them. Um, I'm curious about California, you know, it's in the California constitution, which I think uh, trumps a lot of this. There is a, a fair amount of case law. I'm not sure in the capital context of uh, attorney general jurisdiction um, and oversight responsibilities, I think that we can continue to research. But I, I thought it was interesting because I think it's kind of a novel approach. Um, and again, because geographic disparity seemed to be such um, a highlighted concern in California. And um, I think it's something to, I'm curious about exploring that. Yeah. Another issue that came up, this was from Senator Skinner, was um, an avenue to financially, because again, this relates to geographic disparity, but should, should the counties that uh, rely on the death penalty uh, more than others um, have a cost sharing responsibility? And obviously that's been done in other contexts, uh, probation, um, juvenile sentencing, and um, I think that's worth exploring. I don't know, Senator Skinner, if you had additional thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just a, it's in a way, it's just another way of getting at uh, addressing this, um, the regional disparities, which, um, um, yeah, I don't need to say more. It's. It's just, a, it's one method for getting at that. Um, another issue that we did not discuss, I'm not sure at all, maybe briefly yesterday was clemency. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I think something that's worth addressing is the incredible complication of clemency in California that I don't think people appreciate which is that if, some, if somebody has multiple convictions, right. felon convictions, right. That, that the governor does not actually have uh, carte blanche to um, commute people's sentences. He may offer reprieves, and this is why the moratorium applies to everyone that's carved out. Um, 
So, but if he seeks a pardon or sentence commutation, that if somebody has more than one conviction, that needs to be approved by the California Supreme Court. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's some interesting developments there and some surprising results from some, if, some clemencies that uh, Governor Brown saw. Um, it's a very um, opaque process. There's no litigation at all, right? Parties don't get to present, or at least this is the Supreme Court practice in the past. It is um, a request, I think a letter submitted by the governor to the Supreme Court and then decided in private without, and then the Supreme Court makes it a decision without explanation. Right. Is, is this an issue that wasn't raised in any of the presentations or, or papers? And I've been through that process and I don't think it's a recurrent issue. Maybe you know more about this. I know I, I'm familiar vaguely with the process now about uh, but I think the governor can can go ahead on his own. Uh, but I mean, I don't really see it as an issue that we need to tackle right now. The reason why I bring it up is because so many people to me, again, not experts in this field say, well, if the governor is so committed to abolishing the death penalty, why doesn't he issue clemencies? And I, and I think it, it's again, I, I don't know if unique, but special factor in California law that actually there's a quite a big complication in a large number of the cases. Now, some cases do not have multiple felonies. Yeah, um, well, most do. <laughs> I, I, I mean, that's we one of the factors I mean, in seeking the death penalty. penalty. That's an empirical question that we can find out um, yeah. what the number is. But um, just a little bit of background because I follow this a little bit. Um, I'm going to say three to five years ago, the Supreme Court issued an, a, an order or an opinion. I forget exactly how they styled it, explaining their process to some degree, yeah. um, which I think was helpful. And then, and I think a large, some people in the death penalty community signaled that, uh, saw that, or believed that that was a signal that the Supreme Court was prepared to hear more death penalty clemency applications, of which there have been, I think, zero. Um, and at the same time, there was surprise that some of the clemency applications that uh, Governor Brown had submitted um, were rejected. Yeah. I, I think in the death penalty context, given that moratorium, in my opinion, I think it's, it's relevant. Um, but if the rest of the committee disagrees, then I think that we can avoid the question. Yeah, I think I think we should avoid it. I don't see, think that it's right. I mean, there may be you may there may be some concern about it, but I think you know the the approach that we're on really addresses kind of the salient issues, you know, in terms of uh, charging and conviction, et cetera. But to get into clemency seems to be a whole new uh, area to explore, and I, I wouldn't be in favor of taking it on unless we had you know additional time and and uh, a presentation on both. And I wouldn't want to just rely on, on materials submitted to us. I think we need a whole hearing on that. To me, it seems to be a separate process, separate issue down the road, uh, but uh, not something that I think it's, it's, it's good to delve into at this point. Okay, that, that's fine. Uh, Judge Espinosa or Senator Skinner, do you have feelings on this? I don't know enough about the process to have a strong opinion. I trust, I rely on Carlos's experience yeah. in the death penalty arena, um, which is far superior to mine. I think, I think he's, I would, uh, I would agree with um, Judge Moreno on it. I think it's, uh, I don't know how much of the clemency aspect is in the penal code. Um, and so if it, if it's all in the penal code, then perhaps is it, Mike, or are you right? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's redundant. It's both in the constitution and in the penal code. I'm pretty okay. sure. Okay. Well, given that it's in the constitution and I know that there's some other things in the penal code that are also in the constitution, but given that it's a constitutional authority versus a strictly penal code authority, I think I'd probably yeah. also stay away. Okay, and I think just in terms of, of timing, when we saw what what the last president did with respect to you know pardons and commutations, it's just something that you know 
I, I feel that the Supreme Court should be consulted and have a role in it. They're should the ones should not. I'm sorry, judgment. I misunderstood. Should or should not? Should. There should be a role for the Supreme Court. They, they're the ones who affirm the judgment. And I don't think we should have the governor have unbounded kind of discretion to, to undo. I mean, the timing would be horrendous right now. Um, all right, I'm gonna scratch that off our yeah. list. Um, and we talked about today about perhaps legislation or some other encouragement of district attorneys to have uh, death, death committees, death penalty committees like they do in Los Angeles. Um, yeah, I think that's a great recommendation. Okay. If there are other thoughts that you all want to explore, I mean, obviously we're not making any votes or commitments to this day, to today, but please bring them to my attention or staff's attention so that we can have further discussion of this at our next meeting. We're gonna post, we're, um, I think I'd like to aim at our next committee hearing to hopefully we'll be of a full complement of committee members uh, to vote on our recommendations. Um, we'll then, and in the, mean, in the interim, we'll be preparing the report and then shortly thereafter, uh, publish the report or produce the report in compliance or the, to explaining the recommendations, I should say. And then as we did last time, the committee will vote to approve the report after the recommendations have been made. So in other words, Recommendations are made, report is prepared. We'll be working on collecting data in the interim and then voting on the report. Does that sound like the right process? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, moving on. So that's new business. Anything else to say about the death penalty or what we heard yesterday that anybody wants to raise to make sure we address an open committee? No. Okay. Tentative dates for our next uh, committee hearing. I just want to flag, I believe Senator Skinner, um, I mean, we've, we tentatively agreed almost every six weeks to try to keep on track. And that would bring us to early May, is that, work for people, it's in terms of exact dates, I'll have staff reach out to you, but does that generally work for folks? As long as it's before May 15th, mm. preferably before May 10th, but that's okay. Okay, but between May 1st and May, let's say 10th. Yeah, May week of May 10th is good for me and I'm not sure about the week of May 3rd. I have a hearing that may go. Uh, and okay. the week May 17th is also good, but maybe not for Nancy. We're talking about two days again or one day? I think two days because what we'll have is the topic, I should have said this, the topic is we're gonna be have uh, you know, panels on extreme, extreme non-capital sentences. So very long sentences, LWAP, three strikes, enhancements. That will be day one. And then day two, we will turn to this vote. I mean, I, I'm open now. Um, okay. So the sooner we set the dates so that I can block them out, the, the better. Great. So um, staff will be in touch with, with you all in order to block in those dates, but we're gonna look for early May, certainly before May 15th is the, is the deal. Um, finally, I think that we need to vote to approve the minutes. I hope you guys looked at the minutes from February. That was primarily a scheduling meeting, but I just wanna make sure that everybody was okay to approve the minutes. And uh, can I have a- Well moved. Move it Second. Now. All right. Uh, any objections to adopting the minutes from February? No. no. All right, so the February minutes are approved. Um, unless anybody else has anything to add, I will um, adjourn our meeting for today. Wow. Well moved. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
happy to have a few without extra objection. hours today. Without objection. Yeah, without objection. But okay. great, terrific. The only thing I'd like to close by saying that this is obviously a very um, complicated uh, issue legally, politically, morally. Our staff did a really bang up job again yeah. with um, you know as extra consulting help from Natasha Minsker. Mm -hmm. This was a you know a really detailed report. I think that we're all committed to trying to add to the conversation um, in a substantive way. And um, staff, you know, I think pull out the extra stops on this one. So I just wanted to yeah. acknowledge that. that was so, good. Thanks. The, the only other thing I'd add is that, and well, you've made the comment, Mike, but you know, like when we, we take the example of gay marriage, Californians voted it down, then they voted up. Now we've already voted, unfortunately, the death penalty multiple times, but take cannabis, same thing. We voted yes on, um, medical cannabis, then we voted down recreational, then we voted yes. So as more states are, um, you know, sometimes we like to be the first, sometimes we don't. And we're so big and so complicated in a funny way, I think the more other states take the lead and we've now have more that have pretty much saying they're not gonna do death penalty now. And they're states that are not just what we would consider quote unquote, more blue or more progressive. I think that will, it, it could influence. So it may create an opportunity, for example, for it to be back to the voters. No, I agree. And I think one of the stikers said yesterday that if not in the States, but internationally, at least that, uh, the death penalty, the um, public opinion about the death penalty became strongly against the death penalty only after it was eliminated. But, but that, that is um, similar to the gay marriage, you know, similar to, you know, Governor Newsom's experience with gay marriage mm -hmm. and that, you know, um, yeah. well, we, all know, yeah. we, know, we all, know, all know that story. Right. Um, all right. Well, like I said, thank you. Um, everybody have a good weekend. Thanks especially to the staff. We'll be in touch, especially about scheduling. We'll research those questions. If anything comes up in the interim, um, you're welcome to contact me directly or staff directly. And our next meeting will be in early uh, May. Thank you all. I'm, I, I'm sorry that we have to do this over Zoom because I'd really love to be in person, but um, have a good weekend all the same. Well, I have a great... Um... Whatever Easter. type of celebration you do, whether it's uh, whatever kind, Easter, Passover, or some other. So. Right. Okay. I'm having Passover. I'm having Passover in person with my father. We're all vaccinated, so I'm very excited to see him. So great. that's great. That's yeah. great. All right. Okay. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you all. Bye.